Hi, welcome to the Cooperative Maine Business Alliance P5 Learning Series. My name is Emmy Anderson. I'm the network coordinator for the Cooperative Maine Business Alliance. I'm very excited to have you all here today. We are uh, we're waiting for people to, to join here and there's a lot of people joining. So I'm gonna try to manage that at the same time as I'm talking to you. <laughs> so this uh, workshop is open book management. It's uh, the second in a series of five workshops that um, we are offering this year through the Cooperative Main Business Alliance. And I'm, before we get started with the workshop, I'm gonna go over some workshop agreements with you. So this workshop is being recorded. And if you are uncomfortable with that, um, be, please turn off your video and stay muted. If, you're, if you are comfortable introducing yourself, you can do that by putting your name and affiliation in the chat. And during the presentation, we ask you to keep yourself muted, but take lots of notes and listen carefully. Save your questions for the end of this session in, uh, where we are gonna have a Q and A and um, save both your verbal and your chat questions, please. That way we can monitor the chat and and make sure that we don't lose any of those questions. Uh, if you have any tech related issues, please email me at emmy at main.coop or send me a private chat. Uh, towards the end of our presentation today, we will uh, ask you to fill out a feedback survey and I will be providing that link in the chat for you. There, okay, so today's presenter is Melanie Reed from Columinate um, Network of Consultants. Uh, her expertise is HR and she actually has a lot of areas of expertise. <laughs> she, um, she does HR, uh, organizational culture, uh, recruiting and training of managers and um, an improvement of HR systems and she is very passionate about open book management and it has, has prepared a really, really great presentation for you today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to, to you, Melanie. Thank you, Emmy. Are you to screen? All right, hopefully everybody can see my slide. Up, at me? Yep, it looks good here. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, hi everybody, I'm super excited to be here today to tell you a bit about my, myself and my background and what kind of brought me to this moment uh, with you to share my uh, management. Um, I've been working in the food co-op sector since 1986. I spent um, about 16 or 17 years working in, um, in the food co-op retail environment. Um, I did everything from cashiering to human resources, um, front end manager, operations manager, um, did a couple shifts in the produce department from time to time. Um, and ultimately I was a general manager for four years. Um, and uh, I left my job as a GM to uh, start consulting in 2013 and have been consulting with co-ops all the way ever since then. I 
um, a proud member and representative of Columine. And um, my work takes me um, to um, all, all corners of the country, all sizes of co-ops. Um, and I get to do a wide variety of things as you were mentioning. Um, I do work in all aspects of human resources, do a lot of employee surveys, on employee handbooks, uh, all just general um, HR related kind of, you know, problem solving and troubleshooting. Uh, do some work with the hiring process for general managers and defense in, in the sector. Um, but what about my experience with open book management and, and that really in general, um, I had the experience of, uh, going to the Wheatsville food co-op in Austin, Texas. They, um, really kind of a pioneer when it came to introducing open book management in the, in the co-op sector. And they were really willing to share their experience with open book and invited people to come down and and learn from them and i did that and i the work that they were doing and the way that it was impacting their culture really resonated with me and really felt like what my needed at that time um and so so i cop and put together an implementation team Melanie, can I just interrupt you for a second? Um, your video uh, and audio is cutting out. Do, do you want to try turning your video off? Maybe we yeah. will get a clearer. Let me know if this. Do I sound OK now? I'm not sure yet. Can you uh, continue for a little bit? <laughs> So anyways, uh, back to my co-op, uh, started a maintenance team and ended up rolling out open book management at my store. And what I found was that it was absolutely um, life-changing for our organization. Um, everything really uh, just shifted and... Uh, we ended up creating a culture of sharing and education and participation um, and finance um, that was, um, it really launched our co-op to be able to grow and, and evolve in the ways that we really needed and wanted it to at the time. So part of what I've done over the course of my years as a consultant has been to work with co-ops around the country that have been interested in rolling out open book management themselves. So I've worked with a number of co-ops um, in some different states. I've worked with Berkshire Co-op, the Cook County Co-op in Minnesota, the Durham Co-op down in North Carolina, Roanoke Co-op. I've done a little work with Belfast Co-op. Um, and I'm currently working with the co-op in San Luis Obispo, California. Um, to roll out open bulk. Um, so I've had uh, lots of different experiences. I will say that um, my personal experience and the majority of my experience with open book management does come from the retail food co-op sector. And so the examples and the, um, the financial training module that I'm going to share today is going to be um, focused on the retail sector, mainly because that's what I know. Um, but what I will say is that open book management is transferable to any type of business. Um, and I look forward to being able to answer some questions and maybe dig into that a little bit with some of you who are on the Zoom today um, at the end of the session when we have some time for Q&A. So I just want to acknowledge that I know you're out there. I, I see that there are people from Rock. I see there are people from different co-op sectors in the Zoom today. And so I just want you to know that I see you, I know you're there. 
and um, and that this is all transferable. It just might be that in your particular business, you have different key indicators that you would be looking at. You might have different lines on your board, terms that you are looking for from your open book management. Um, but it is definitely um, it is definitely transferable. So I am going to kind of talk a little bit about the, the, the sort of roots. Open book management is something that was started by a, a fellow by the name of Jack Stack. Um, some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may have already read his book, which is called The Great Game of Business. Um, Jack Stack had a company called the Springfield Remanufacturing Corporation. It was struggling. This was back in the 80s. And he needed to try to figure out a way that he could save his struggling business. And he came up with this idea that if everybody in the company knew more and understood more about the financial side of running that business, that that would have to be a good thing. And so he, he came up with this model that he wrote about in his book, The Great Game of Business. He wrote another book called A Stake in the Outcome. From, from that and from his willingness to share his experience, this movement was born around open book management. You may have heard open book management um, referred to as the great game of business. Um, and thinking about the great game concept, um, if there are any of you in the Zoom today who are sports fans, or if not a sports fan, maybe um, you like to play a game of, of some sort. I want you to imagine for a moment what it would be like to watch your favorite sport or play your favorite game if you didn't know the rules, if you didn't know what the equipment was used for, or if you didn't know how to keep score, that would seem absurd, right? So the question then is, why is it any different to have employees who are uninformed about the most important aspects of our cooperative businesses, doing all the good work of running the business without knowing rules how to keep score. That seems absurd, right? So how do we change that? Well, open book management is one of the ways that we can change that. Open book management is a revolutionary way of managing a business where employees at all levels, no matter what their position, no matter what their day-to-day -day responsibilities, are informed, involved, and empowered to understand the financial bottom line as well as they understand the people and planet bottom lines of our triple bottom line businesses. And they're empowered to make change happen within the organization and to participate in the decisions that allow for those changes to happen. And these changes are measured and reported and talked about in regular meetings. Normally those meetings happen weekly. Um, these changes are tracked on a scoreboard, which is uh, referred to as a big board in, in open book management, and everyone is invited to participate. So it becomes this place where information is shared, where ideas are shared, where numbers are discussed, where stories are told, um, and it's really, um, it's really a fantastic way to take your business from, uh, from one level 
people to the next level. So uh, we are going to talk about today um, over the course of the next uh, hour and a half or so, we're gonna, we're gonna try to expand our collective knowledge of open the potential that it has um, to your cooperative business. I'm gonna offer you some information and guidance about implementation of open book at your business. I'm going to share with you a sample financial literacy training module that you could then build out for business to teach your staff um, about some basics of finance. And at the end, I will answer questions or hopefully I will do my best to answer all open book management so that you um, feel ready to go forward um, at, your, at your own co-op. So I like to think uh, about open book management as a way to create a culture of engagement, education, participation, and fun. All of those things are, are, are so important, right? So I think about workplace as really that internal culture that exists among the employee business. It's that set of norms and expectations written and unwritten rules that guide the daily interactions between the people. And by creating a healthy culture within our co-ops where everyone knows and is working towards the same goals, we build an environment that fosters participation, that fosters communication, and that fosters engagement of our employees. I'm sure that you are all familiar with those that come out on an annual basis. There are a number of organizations that compile lists of exceptional employers. See your organization one of those lists um, at some point in time. I know that the co-op that's living in Minnesota has been on a list of best employers um, a couple of times. Um, well, I did some digging. What I discovered was that there are common themes among employers who top those lists. And some of those common threads are things like trust and engagement, transparency, communication, and intention. And from my perspective, these attributes all align with the kinds of workplaces that most co-ops are seeking to build. They align with the cooperative principles that guide our organizations. And in my own experience, it feels really pretty awesome to work in a place that builds a culture that includes all of these things. It makes it a joy to go to work and to have a workplace um, where you feel like your voice is heard, where you feel like your participation is welcome, where you're learning things, where you feel like you're always growing. And so, um, Alongside the financial focus of open book is really all of these other things that are so important. So I want to take some time to talk a little bit about each of these areas. So um, in terms of engagement, there are, you know, kind of a, a couple different ways of defining engagement, if you will. Um, but it's really about the extent to which employees feel passionate about their jobs and their level of commitment to the organization. A lot of time built about a connection to uh, the values of the organization or a connection to 
the goals and the vision of the organization as being really important aspects of engagement. Employees are engaged to put more effort into their work. They have a tendency to um, contribute more work. And if you're in, in the business of service, which many of you are, there's a high likelihood that engaged employees are going to provide a better service experience for your customers. And make for a bottom line at the end of the day. Um, sadly, statistics on employee engagement show that only somewhere between 15 and 30% of people would say that they're engaged at their workplace. Additionally, there are, there's a high percentage of people who are either actively or passively looking for a new job at any point in time. And these statistics might be some during pandemic, but I think it's really still important to think about because turnover is high. And one of the things that tends to be true of employees who are highly engaged is that they tend to stay longer with their employer they don't move around as much. So it's meaningful um, for your business to have that high level of employee engagement. The other thing that um, is important is education. So I wanna talk a little bit about education. Something that I have learned in all the years that I've worked in co-ops is that co-op employees by and large place a high value on education, training, and information. And it's one of our principles, right? We're all here today under cooperative principle number five. And I wanna circle back to what I said earlier about the idea of people playing a game or playing a sport without knowing the rules or your employees running your business without knowing how the financial system works. I think it goes without saying that providing them with education will be beneficial to the employees in terms of really understanding the inner workings of your business. And I also found when we rolled out open book management at the co-op that I used to manage, I had employees who went home and taught some of the financial principles to their partner or to their roommate and had open book big boards on their refrigerators to help them track their living expenses and things like that. So it really ended up being uh, you know, somewhat life-changing for people in their personal lives as well. Um, so there's a lot to be said um, for education, right? There are so many reasons why education is important in our cooperative environments. And really one of the things that open book management does is it creates a setting each and every week for sharing information. I had an employee once who said that they felt like our open book management meeting was like a live version of our employee newsletter because there were so many things being shared um, above and beyond just the numbers. So why is participation important? Um, one of my favorite things to remind managers is that you don't have all the answers. <laughs> None of us has all the answers. But the good news is um, our cooperative organizations are filled with people who have lots of ideas, who have lots of solutions, who have lots of potential answers to any problem that we might be trying to solve. And so participation serves as a place to facilitate the sharing of ideas 
about how to make the co-op stronger and better. All employees share in the satisfaction and the financial rewards when the co-op achieves our strategic goals. And through Open Book, you can give them a place where they can participate in creating those goals and tracking progress towards those goals. In Open Book, employees at all levels of the organization are really able to take ownership which again sort of goes back to those um, foundational aspects of a cooperative, that idea of ownership and everyone having a stake in the business is really also foundational to, um, to open book management and, and everything that it brings about in your organization. And most importantly, there's fun. <laughs> Open book management um, is a way to make numbers fun. And it's a way to uh, take away some of the maybe anxiety or the barriers for people who don't necessarily feel a strong connection to the numbers. Uh, it's a way to allow them to uh, understand and, and be able to participate in new ways. Um, so uh, I mentioned that kind of the root of the open book experience is really what happens at the weekly meeting. So generally, um, there's a time set aside every week where the meeting happens and you gather around your big board, your, your scoreboard, and you do some storytelling. You talk about the numbers in the context of how the week went. You talk about why the numbers are the way they are. Um, you talk about things that went really, really well during that week. What did you see in my department that you loved is a common question that gets asked. What did you see in my department that I could have done better is another common question that gets asked. What you're seeking to create in this weekly meeting environment is a space for all of these talked about for engagement for education and for sharing information and ideas. And making that a fun space and a safe space for everyone to participate is really, really important. You want this to be the meeting that everybody wants to come to every week um, because by everyone wanting to come to the meeting, you're going to get a higher level of participation. And the energy from that meeting is much more likely to spread throughout the store. Now, I have to be honest and tell you that creating a fun meeting is one thing, but keeping the meeting fun over the course of time can be somewhat challenging. So it is important to always kind of have your eye on that meeting and go into that meeting every week questioning whether it's still fun. Because sometimes with open book, you, you need to kind of go back before you can go forward. Sometimes it gets stale and you need to switch things up. And so there are, you know, a variety of ways in which you can do that, but I mention it only so that you're thinking about the fact that fun doesn't just happen on its own and, um, you know, successful and e efficient and productive meetings don't just happen on their own either. And so it does take work um, for sure. And it does take kind of keeping an eye on it and making sure that it stays fresh. So 
now that you're super excited because you want to have a fun meeting every week, <laughs> we should probably talk a little bit about how to do this. How do you do this in your organization? Well, the good news is there's really only three key things that you need to remember in order to create a successful open book management program. And those three things are that you have to know and teach the rules. You have to keep score and then you have to share in the success that comes from your program. And so as you're thinking about rolling this out and even as you um, maybe start work on this uh, in an immediate way, you can keep on kind of coming back to these three things. Um, and, and, and that's a really easy framework within which to create your, your initiative and, and roll out your initiative. So it all starts with a vision. Um, part of knowing and teaching the rules, that first rule of open book management is that everyone needs to be able to see and understand and share the vision for where you're going. The vision is about capturing the idea of where your organization hopes to go as a result of open book management. So where do you see yourself being? What do you hope to achieve through this initiative? So I'll tell you a little bit about how to, how to begin writing a vision. And typically the vision is the part of the work that is led by the general manager or the key leader in your organization, whatever that position is called within your organization. This is the, this is the one of a couple parts of book management that really are uh, initiated by, I don't wanna say owned by, but initiated by that, uh, that key leader in your organization. So the key leader will ask a few key questions in order to come up with what this vision will be. Some of those key questions, what will a successful culture of great finance look like one to two years down the road? This is a sort of a long game, but not, not so long that it doesn't feel achievable to everybody who's gonna read the vision, right? So it's good to take like a one year look or maybe a two years look, two years look. Where do we, where do we think we're gonna be in a year? What, what would I as a leader of this organization see as success? And then think about those aspects of culture that we talked about. Think about the engagement level and think about your employees participating and sharing information and all of those things that we just talked about. What would you like to see change in your workplace culture as a result of open book management? How do you envision people interacting with each other um, as a result? What will your successful meetings look like down the road? Um, I remember writing a vision for my own open book implementation and, and um, in my vision, I actually talked about what it would feel like in the room and what the energy would be like in the room if we were having a fun meeting. So I had a really clear idea in my head of what I wanted that to look like. And then how does the open book management connect to the ends of your organization or the goals of your co-op, whatever you call those overarching 
dreams that you have that you're trying to achieve. Some of us call them ends, some of them call them goals, some of them call a vision statement, um, could be any number of those things. So once you are able to come up with this vision, the vision really will help to guide the initiative and really will be the foundation of the work and the journey that you are going to embark on um, with Open Book Management. Now, as an accompaniment to the vision, another thing that the uh, organizational leader, the general manager will work on is a list of compelling reasons. This is kind of like the why. Why am I putting energy into this? Why am I putting organizational resources into this? The compelling reasons support the vision and also help with communication strategies. So these compelling reasons are going to help everybody in your organization understand what this is all about. Open book is one of those concepts that is a little bit challenging to fully understand unless you've experienced it. And so in the early stages of implementing and introducing open book, it can be a little hard for people to, you know, sort of wrap their minds around what you're aiming for. So sharing this list of compelling reasons can help people to begin to wrap their minds around what it's going to look like. So again, a few questions that could be helpful in coming up with this list of compelling reasons. Why are you considering implementing Open Book? What is it that is exciting about it to you? What do you hope to change as a result of implementing Open Book Management? What are you excited about and what opportunities do you see for your organization um, as, as a result of open book? How do you see this really being the impetus for some changes? And you wanna think about not only financial success, but also cultural goals and goals related to your co-ops ends. One of the things that it is important to emphasize when you begin talking about it is that it's not just about numbers and it's not just about dollars and it's not just about talking about the um, financial bottom line. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this as we, as we go forward, but sometimes I've had the experience where people have read the Jack Stack book, The Great Game of Business. And while they found it interesting and fascinating, they also felt like, gosh, we're a co-op and this makes it seem like the only thing that we're gonna be focusing on is the financial bottom line. And we feel like the other bottom lines are important as well. And this doesn't quite feel like it's right um, within our cultures. So part of the challenge with, um, with rolling out open book in a cooperative setting is really to make sure that you're putting quite a bit of focus on some of the um, aspects of your, uh, your ends and your, and your other bottom line so that people don't get too lost in this is only about numbers. So now that you have your vision and your compelling reasons and you are super excited about rolling this out, it is time to talk about the steps towards implementation. And this can take as long as you want it to take. Um, one of the things 
that I've always found really cool about open book management is that there really aren't any rules. And it's good to remind yourself as you are working towards implementation that there really aren't any rules. There are some models and there are some examples and some experiences that others have had with open book management. There are books you can read. There are consultants who will talk to you about it. There are other cooperative businesses that have, have implemented it and, and you know love it. But there really aren't any rules. It's all about making it fit for your organization and focusing it on the, the things that are important to you and to your team at your organization. Um, in order to move towards implement, the first thing is to work on building organizational readiness for this. So attending a workshop such as this is a, a really great way to start kind of learning some of the basics and some of the experiences that another person has had. I also always recommend talking with people at other cooperative organizations that are successfully using open book management, or for that matter, who are unsuccessfully using it, because I think that there are things to be learned from that as well. Um, but really just to hear other people's experiences is really a, a helpful part of the process in, in terms of building readiness. I always highly recommend starting with reading the book, The Great Game of Business. And I encourage doing kind of a book club style reading of it. So read the book and then get a group of people together who are really interested and have a conversation about it. Talk about what you read, talk about how it landed with you talk about how you feel like it would fit well uh, into your organization and the, and the structure that you have. Talk about how it fits in with some of the goals that you have organizationally. Um, and then, you know, decide whether it feels right. And if it does, make that commitment. Set that intention and know that you want, um, you want to roll it out. And I, and I think it's good to set a timeline for yourself. What's the goal? How long do we want to work through these steps of implementation? And when would we really like to see ourselves having our first weekly meeting? When would we like to see a, a scoreboard or a big board up on our wall to begin keeping score and, and keeping track of our, of our finances in a way that we can all see that's right there front and center in our workspace. So once readiness is built, the next step is really to create an implementation team, to form an implementation team. Your implementation team is going to do all the legwork, really. Um, this, is a, this is an actual working team. They're gonna do the legwork leading up to implementation and are really likely to then play some of the key roles once you start having your weekly meeting. Um, there are going to be various roles in order to ensure that that meeting runs smoothly, um, there's gonna be kind of a team of people that are going to take that on every week. There's going to be a facilitator and a note taker, and there will be people who are going to own each of the lines and who are willing to get up in front of the room and tell the story of the numbers on each of those lines. So there are plenty of roles within the meeting itself. And oftentimes the people who have been on the implementation team are the, are the people who take those, those roles um, for the first few months or six months of the meeting. And those roles 
um, are certainly changeable. People can move in and out of those roles over time, um, but usually starts with the implementation team because they're the people who are the most engaged. Um, team members will also be helping to make some decisions about what you'll be tracking on the big board um deciding what those lines are going to be on that board once you're ready to to put that board together and then in addition they will also be um, putting tools in place that will enable easy access to the data that goes on the board so one of the things that's important is that once you decide what those numbers are that you want to track that you have an easy way of accessing that information so that it can get put on the board on a weekly basis. So there might need to be some adjustment to the tools that you're using. Um, I can give an example of a tool being, um, it might be that you are currently doing your payroll every two weeks. But in an open book environment, you're going to be wanting to track labor on a weekly basis. So you're going to need a tool um, that will provide you with easy access to your labor numbers um, every week before your meeting. So, uh, so someone on the implementation team would volunteer to put that tool together, work with your finance manager, um, make sure that you have easy access to that data. And that's just, you know, one example. I'm sure there are, are many others. The people on the implementation team are also going to be the voices of open book management within your organization leading up to implementation. They're going to be the ones who are generating excitement among staff about the program. They're going to be the ones who are answering questions and just in general kind of sharing their excitement about um, the implementation. So I like to say, you know, look for people who are enthusiastic, who um, really dove into the reading of the book and who really embraced, um, you know, participating in that book club meeting, for example. People who are really excited. Also look for people who are good communicators and who are good sort of cheerleaders. Um, and I think it's helpful if, um, if they're comfortable being in front of a room and have a willingness to um, be in front of a room in a somewhat imperfect situation because oftentimes um, open book management meetings are, are, are very, very infrequently perfect, um, but they're always fun and everybody always learns a lot. But you have to be somewhat comfortable in that, you know, sort of imperfect environment. I usually say five or six people on an implementation team is a good number. Um, preferably not all managers. It's nice if you can have broad representation from all of the different areas within your business, as well as different levels within your organization to be represented. Um, and then it's good to have a team leader who can kind of keep things going forward. Um, and it's nice if the GM or the whatever the, the leader of the organization can kind of take a step back. It's good for them to be engaged with what's going on, but part of the charm of open book is that it allows staff members to take ownership of something and so if the if the gm or the or the leader of the organization is too involved and too hands-on then people can have a tendency to sort of back away from that so you really want to 
put this initiative in the hands of staff as much as possible. Uh, in terms of communication, part of the work of the implementation team will be to develop a communication strategy. And really the idea is to motivate all co-op staff to get excited about participating. So there should be some pre-implementation communication, um, some planning for some kind of a, a rollout celebration uh, when you have your first meeting um, and inviting everybody to participate in that. And then, you know, sharing information about what it is, the vision, the compelling reasons, maybe some articles about open book so that people can begin to kind of engage with the idea and be excited about attending. Um, it's going to be very important to um, begin to come up with an idea about what your big board is going to look like. Um, that's where you're going to be tracking all your numbers and it is a little bit of a project. So if you have anybody on your team that's rather handy um, and, and you can pair that person with someone who's rather creative, uh, you can come up with a big board uh, on which you will track your numbers. And well, somewhere in here, you'll see a picture of a big board. I thought it was my next slide, but you will see one. <laughs> so you'll have to hold on. Um, and then there will be the financial tools. As I mentioned, you're going to need to get the numbers onto the big board. And so thinking about what existing tools you have, which tools you might need to modify, and is there information that you're going to need for the big board that you currently can't access, and assigning some responsibilities for creating those tools um, and figuring out what the timeline is um, for having those tools in place. And the last piece of implementation is coming up with um, the game. So the game allows you to share in the financial success generated by open book management. And there are a few different options and there's probably more options than I'm aware of. Um, one way is to create a game share program um one is a profit sharing game so sh sharing back some percentage of um, profits with with team members um, in a retail setting sometimes you can do a sales per labor hour game and share gains that way um and there might be others as well there are oftentimes some bigger financial games that are played and you might have some smaller games um, that are happening within open book as well and the um, the rewards um, for the smaller games are usually smaller as well it might be something like a pizza party or gift cards to the store or you know, going bowling or something like that um, instead of like a bonus check. So there are lots of different ways and um, you may have realized in, in all of this, there is so much room for creativity and there's so much room to really customize this to fit with your organization and with the with the internal culture that you already have. So um, that's the thing about there not being any rules is that you don't have to do any of this in any particular way. You get to decide what is gonna work the best for you. So I wanna talk a little bit about meaningful metrics. So this gets at what are the lines on the board? What are the meaningful numbers that you want to be tracking? Some things to think about um, here is that um, the metric doesn't necessarily have to be on the financial statement. 
also, um, anyone can propose a line. It doesn't have to come from the GM or anyone in particular. Um, importantly, however, it's got to be something that's measurable and that um, employees have some degree of control over. Otherwise, they're not going to feel like they're able to impact it. And then it has to be owned. So somebody has to be willing to own the line and get up at the meeting every week and tell the story of the line. And so if you have something that you think you want to track, but no one's willing to own it, then it's probably not the right thing to be tracking. Maybe it will be later, but it's got to be owned in order for it to be on the board. You can't have a line on the board that nobody owns. So the big board um, really is the scoreboard and it kind of leads you to action and it's the centerpiece for your weekly meeting. Um, you can compare your numbers for current to what you had planned in your budget and you can then respond to changing conditions um, in a way that you can't when you're not looking at it on a weekly basis basis and as a group. See, the baselines in a retail setting are sales and labor for each department or profit center in the store. And again, these are going to vary if you have a different type of business, but thinking about one of the, the most key um, indicators that employees have some level of control over. It's also good to have a few lines that are more oriented towards the ends or the organizational values. As I mentioned before, some examples of this might be um, number of new co-op owners or dollars donated in the community or customer service shout outs. Um, there are, again, a lot of ways to get creative with what these extra lines are that you put on your board. And, um, you know, because numbers can be kind of a turnoff for some, some staff members might think that the co-op is, you know, going corporate or only thinking about money. Um, it's good to have these extra lines. Um, when I was doing open book, we had a line for dollars donated in the community and that line ended up being I, for sure, like my favorite line on our board and oftentimes the best line of the meeting because not only did we hear, oh, you know, we donated a hundred dollars here, a hundred dollars there, but it gave a, it gave everybody on the staff this view into some of the work of our marketing and outreach department. So maybe they were at the, um, uh, the fun run, you know, for the YMCA or whatever, and the co-op donated fruit and beverages to the runners, or maybe they were, maybe they made a donation to a silent auction at one of the local nonprofit organizations, or they donated a basket to one of the local schools or something like that. It gave us this real sense of the good work that our co-op was doing in our community that I think became obvious to me that everybody was not aware of. And so that became really a special part of the meeting in a really cool way. People better understand the kinds of impact that our co-op was having. Um, typically each line will have three sections. One is your plan, that's your budget. One is your forecast, which is what you think you're going to achieve. And then the third is the actual. So you're able to compare um, what you thought you were gonna do with what you actually did and how that measures up with what your budget was. Um, and what else? I guess that's about all I have to say. I mean, again, there are a lot of ways to get creative. And one of the things to think about with lines is that whatever the lines are on the board, you can bet that they will be impacted 
So if there are areas that you feel like you really need to focus on, then those are good things to put on the board. Um, I have an example from a co-op that I worked with and they were really struggling with timely performance evaluations for their staff. And so they were really late on a lot of their performance evaluations and they decided that they wanted to track it on their big board. And so they put up a line and they started tracking and they started forecasting. And at the end of a year, they ended up only having three late performance evaluations out of 196 for an entire year. So they were really able to move the needle on this area that they were really struggling with by simply putting it up on the board and keeping track of it over time. And lines can and will change. So no line is necessarily um, set in stone. Here is the picture of the big board. And um, this is, this kind of just shows you how um, you can see on the left side, you've got sales lines for each department, then you've got labor lines for each department, and then going across the top, you have not only your time frame, so each week, but then you've got your plan, your forecast, and your actual. So this is just one example. Um, and again, it's, you know, you can get creative with this. Um, lower down where you can't see in this picture is where the um, extra lines that I talked about, such as, you know, dollars donated or new owners or things like that. Those are just this. I was just trying to illustrate um, the sales labor and the, the time frames going across. So that just gives you an idea of, of what a big board would look like. One of the, the um, one of the things you'll want to do is to offer a financial literacy training to all your staff as part of readiness for this. And this is just an opportunity for staff to get an understanding of some of the basic um, financial terms and give them a chance to play around with, you know, calculating a margin, for example. Um, and this is important because it allows everyone to really fully participate and to start with a basic level of knowledge that empowers them to be able to come up with good solutions. It's really hard to feel like you can have impact on margin, for example, if you have no idea what a margin is, and if you have no idea what people are talking about when they say margin, um, then you're going to not be as inclined to um, feel like you can participate in that conversation. So giving a basic understanding, I think, is a really good way to create a foundation for people. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through this is a sample of, um, again, for a retail environment, and it would be, you know, something that you could modify um, for your own type of business and your own key numbers that you use. But the objectives being just to give employees a basic understanding of the some basic financial terms. Um, typically, we work with a P&L, we do a margin, we do labor, we do balance sheet. Um, those are kind of the basics. It really helps people if they um, if they know how to play the game, right? If they know um, what the tools are, if they understand the tools, then they're better able to um, play the game. The other thing that I love so much about going through this financial literacy training is that it connects every single staff member to how 
the work that they do every day impacts the financial performance of the co-op. So you'll see that I have built in here to this um, sample training module, some various discussions. And so that allows to really start to dig in with people about how their work impacts things. The first discussion is about why profit is important to the co-op and what are some of the things we can do in the community when we are a profitable business? Where do we put those profits and, and how do those profits have impact beyond the walls of our co-op? I think this really starts to give people that sense of um, why the co-op is so important in the community. And then, just kind of going into a few of the basic financial terms. Now, anybody in your organization can lead this training. Sometimes it's the finance manager, sometimes it's the general manager, sometimes it's a consultant from outside who comes in and does it for you. Um, it's really anybody who feels up to the task um, should should take this on. And it's really kind of a group effort, I would say, to put this together and to make sure that it really fits well and that the activities um, work well with your organization and are easy to facilitate in the meeting setting. I usually suggest the meeting doesn't last more than an hour. Like it's a pretty short training session. You're not trying to teach people everything. You're really just trying to offer them a basic overview of uh, some of these key things and give them a chance for some discussion as well as a little bit of actual calculation. <laughs> so these are some of the things that I would include in terms of basic financial terms. And then it's good to talk about net income, um, particularly in the retail setting. We know that retail grocery is a low margin business. We know there's not a lot left over. Um, at the end of the day, if we're doing good, you know, we have a penny for every dollar. Um, and it's good also to talk about, you know, even when sales are increased, it decrease if um, the expenses aren't well managed. So it's kind of just teaching people in a nutshell um, sort of how the PL works. And you can also show that in the form of a pie. So um, here's what a PL looks like in a pie graph. And I like to talk about um, the pie. And I like to talk about making the slices richer rather than larger. And so what I mean by that is you probably have, for example, um, a labor budget and you probably don't want your labor to go more than, I'm just gonna say 25% because it's an easy number. So your labor budget is 25%. It can't go to 30%. But you're still going to want to have over the course of time because people like to get raises. And so in order to make that 25% richer, so make it more dollars, the only way to do that is to make your pie bigger. So you got to make the pie bigger in order to make the slices of pie richer because they can't get any bigger. And so this is one way of illustrating that in one way of thinking about the work that everybody can do together to make that pie bigger. Another activity that I love is to take 100, 100 pennies or you know whatever it adds up to a dollar and walk through the PL. So go through the PL and say, all right, we're going to put 25 cents. Um, we're gonna have to pay 25 cents for our payroll. We're gonna have to pay, you know, whatever it is, 60 cents for our cost of goods and go through all of the kind of key expense categories. And most of the time when you get to through all those expense categories, maybe you'll have one penny left. Maybe you'll run out of pennies <laughs> depending on how your co-op is doing. 
Um, and so it's a really good way to illustrate to people in a really simple activity um, that you know idea of how how low that margin really is and how little there is left um, at the end of the year. And then moving into margins and giving people an opportunity to understand what a margin is, how a margin is calculated, and then talking a little bit about what some of the common margin targets are for various departments and why those vary department to department. So for example, why does your um, prepared foods have a higher margin? Why does your wellness have a higher margin? Why does your dairy have a lower margin? Those kinds of things, just kind of helping people have an understanding of, of how margins work. And then um, talking about what are some of the ways that people's work impacts the margin, right? So really getting people talking, generating some discussion about the ways in which everybody has an impact on that margin. And this can be really, really powerful for people in recognizing that some of these little details of their jobs are actually very, very important to the bottom line of the business. So getting that conversation going is really important. And then talk about labor and, um, you know, the, just the different ways of thinking about it, direct labor, margin minus labor, total personnel. So the difference between what is direct labor versus what is total personnel and where, how the benefits fit in. Talk a little bit about what the industry standard is for labor percentage. And again, the differences between different departments and why some departments have lower mar labor targets than other that. And then you can give people an opportunity to um, use your PL to calculate department level and store wide labor percentage. So giving people an opportunity to get out their calculator, play around with some numbers, um, look, look through the PL and you know, kind of discover where some of these numbers are found. And, and things like that. Just, you know, giving people that practice, that opportunity to really um, play around a little bit with those numbers. And the discussion for labor is, you know, why is it important? Why do we have to keep the labor at, let's just say 25%? After cost of goods in a retail setting, labor is the largest expense. And so why, why is that important? Why is that something that we want to be thinking about. And then what are the ways in which we can impact labor in our daily work? And so talking about some of the ways that people can use their time efficiently and make good use of meeting and, and all of those things, all of those ways that people can have impact on that. And then moving into some discussion about why we want to use open book management to again, explore ways to make that pie bigger, make those slices richer, and um, talking through some of the ways that everybody can help to grow sales. Just really good opportunities for discussion and to really just kind of get people thinking about the importance of the work that they're doing every day. In, in your organization. And then I, um, I usually end the financial literacy training with just a little bit of an intro to open book, just to kind of set the stage for people. So just a you know, little definition of open book, what is it? Recommend if they want to read the book, they can. Talk about that vision and those compelling reasons that you've come up with. Um, uh, and, and share that and kind of talk that through a little bit, talk about that scoreboard, what the weekly meeting is going to be like, when it's going to start, invite everybody to participate in that and, and share with them what that game is going to be and 
what um, what they might um, in what ways you might share some of the success um, of open book with everybody on the team so that just kind of leaves them with a little bit of an overview so again that's just one sample of a financial literacy training but i do think it's an important part of creating the foundation so that everybody can really understand what some of those key indicators are that you're tracking on your board so I now have, um, I've got just one more slide just to say, I, I hope that we cover all the things I said we were going to cover and that um, I look forward to your questions. And I think Emmy is going to assist me with navigating this Q&A session. And um, I can't wait to hear what's on all of your minds and i'm going to not share my screen and then i'm going to try my video again so maybe i can feel like i'm in the room with you all we'll see how my internet does hopefully i'll be able to see you and hear you So we can take questions both verbally or you can put them in the chat if you would like to do that. And anyone that has a question can raise their hand or unmute and uh, yeah, we can just do a popcorn style question. Corinne. Um, I'm curious, how much open book management would you suggest one shares with one's members? Hmm. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I don't quite know how to answer that. I mean, I think that there are aspects of it that you're sort of already sharing because in a way it's, it's a summary of your finances. It's just in a smaller time block. You're looking at it on a weekly basis. You're already sharing it with your members, I suppose, typically on an annual basis. Um, I have seen boards of directors be really interested in it and even attend open book meetings. Um, but I'm not as familiar with opening it up wider um, to the membership. So I guess that would sort of be up to you on an individual basis if you were comfort you were comfortable opening it up that far. Yeah, I mean I know we share all the share all the numbers, but I don't think anybody really pays much attention to them as far as long as they're getting coming into the store and they're getting their stuff there. They're happy on the one hand. On the other hand, I want them to understand, I want them to hear a bit more about the the challenges and how to help us overcome them because it is their co-op after all it's not right. just the employees or the board's co-op it's their co-op too and and in some ways i feel like you know particularly the financial literacy piece that would be interesting and looking right. at the goals you know fo focusing more i know we can do it at the annual meeting but there's a lot of stuff to go through at the annual meeting which probably wouldn't do a deep dive in the same way i i just feel as though our members just think it all happens it's like magic and <laughs> it's not like magic, it's hard work. So that's why I was curious. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they do think it happens just like magic. So it'd be interesting once you had something up and running to create a, a space, maybe it was once a month or something where you would open it up and so you're invited if you want to come and, and see this in action. And I hear you, there's a lot going on at annual meetings, but that, the first thing that came to my mind is like, wow, that would be kind of a cool thing to do at an annual meeting, like just do a presentation on it and capture some of the highlights here and some of maybe the successes that you had um, as a result of those meetings and, and really kind of share that story as part of your annual meeting. I feel like that could be kind of cool. Um, can I, 
Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, hey, hey, Melanie, thanks. That's really useful. And I, I clearly see the benefits for workers to sort of be involved um, and have this information and be part of that process. Um, what I'm just kind of curious as sort of rolling this out, what are potential uh, places where you've seen risk for, back, I don't want to say backfiring, but just challenges to sort of see coming and maybe overcome before we get there? Um, any, any sort of things to look out for to make sure we um, keep in mind before implementation? Sure, yeah, great question. I think uh, the biggest thing is that that concept that I, I talked about of having connect in with your ends and your and your vision and have suspects of it be not so focused on numbers um, and really try to think of it as changing the entire culture of the organization rather than being financially focused. Um, so that would be my first thing. thing that's good to know and kind of think about going into it is the first few meetings will be a little difficult. Like it's hard to sort of find the groove with it. And it can be uncomfortable at first for people to get up and tell stories and, and share the numbers. And even it's just like they don't want to share the numbers because it feels like if their numbers aren't good, then they have to stand up in the room and, you know, sort of admit the failure, if you will. Um, so I think it's super important to create a really safe environment where you know, everybody does feel comfortable sharing the numbers and that it's never about, you know, it's anyone's fault, or um, it's just it's just about sort of sharing reality, and to really try to create the sense that we're all in this. And so, if you have, for example, an area that's you know struggling with sales, as as is oftentimes the case, right? One department or another is maybe having a really hard time. It's really good if you can get everybody to rally around that department, you know, and, and really, you know, throw all kinds of love and energy into that line for a little while until the rebound. And that really builds, you know, sort of trust and, you know, everyone's here to help each other. And then the last thing I would say is to know that um, <laughs> it, it doesn't happen by magic. And you have to really um, maintain it, have to love and nurture your open book. Um, you know, it's sort of like getting a puppy or something. You have to like take care of it. Like it requires a lot of care and you always have to keep your eye on it and make sure that it stays fresh and that it is fun and that people want to come and that people are getting a lot out of it. Um, and that requires work and, and and attention over the long haul. You know, it's kind of a long uh, to keeping your eye on things. Great, right, thanks. There's, I wanted to make an, an observation and just get your feedback on it. I, I mean, we've talked a lot about sharing information, um, but it seems that the that you use the word magic at some point. The the magic happens when like people are actually like it's not just the sharing of information; it's like engaging them and using the information to make good choices and help make decisions and identify ways to identify efficiencies, find new revenue opportunities. Um, I was thinking about it in terms of the resident owned communities, like do the residents in a resident owned community understand what the break even point is for lot occupancy, right? Like that's yeah. a simple yeah. target. And I bet a lot of residents in Rocks don't understand what that number is. If a resident right. moves out, is that problematic? So can you talk about, can you just talk more about like the engagement piece specifically and not just the sharing of information, but like the engagement piece? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think your, your observation is up. Right. The idea is to give them the information so that they can use. It, I think part of the engagement comes in that meeting setting where you're having these, you know, deep conversations about what's going on in your business. And so it gives opportunity to, you know, sort of demonstrate to each other, teach each other share page with the information and then people are able to also i think utilize now what they know in their everyday so for example as we were going through the sample of the financial training and engaging in those discussions about the ways that each person's uh, daily tasks can really have impact and so hopefully, you know, they leave that training and are now paying more attention to deals in the work that they're doing every day. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's a little different in a different business model, but I think that same idea of, yeah, use, you, we're all using now what we know um, and, and engaging with each other in how to move the needle in these different areas. Did that answer your question, Rob? <laughs> yeah, somewhat. I, I, I mean, I'm just, I think the struggle is the very practical, specific strategies or tools or systems that generate the engagement, that, that generate the willingness to engage in helping make good decisions for the company. So it's, it's like that, that little thing that, is where I see people get hung up. Because if you're just, you know, you share information and you want people to be engaged, I just worry that this, there's a sense like, that's great, so what, right? Um, <laughs> on the part of too many people. So how do you, just how do you use the information to engage them in decision-making about the future of the co-op? To a certain degree, I think that comes that uh, I think you, how do I want to say this? I think you incentivize them wanting to change things because they're sharing in that success. So somehow there's a reward. So maybe they're going to get a bonus or maybe they're going to get a gift card or maybe they're going to get some other reward and there's a win. When we move the needle on the way that we said we were going to, then we all win. And so if we all play, maybe we're all gonna win more than if only half of play. But I will also say that there is a certain reality to this that you, you are building a culture of participation and so if a person does not want to be a participant in that church, then they might decide that they don't want to work at your business and this is this is a reality um, this happened to me I had people leave because they did not want to they just wanted to come work do their job leave not be a participant and we really wanted everyone to be a participant so i think it's important to you know really think hard about what it is that you're trying to create and recognize that it's possible that not everybody is going to want to be a part of that culture if that makes sense not that you're trying to like push anyone out. What you're really trying to do is pull people in, but some people don't want to be a part of that. So that can happen. Like I said, it happened to me. I had people leave because they didn't want to participate. And I didn't force anyone to participate, but you know, everyone else wanted to participate. <laughs> Thank you. So we have Jeffrey uh, has a question and then Angela. So Jeffrey, why don't you go first? I'm going to lower my hand. Well, okay. 
Uh, so I was thinking of another question, but then uh, Rob's uh, kind of uh, uh, brought up another aspect to it. So, I, but I think they go together. So I'm uh, I'm more in a startup situation. So I'm curious if you've uh, carried this kind of approach out in uh, different kinds of uh, startups where you're just starting from literally zero. And then my thought, and then part of that is chicken and egg is how do you get that participation when you don't have any results yet, <laughs> right? And uh, then, they, then the thinking that I've had around our, our startup is, well, not everybody is going to want to invest that time to participate uh, at that level that you would, that uh, at the big board level, so to speak. So that uh, when you're starting at the startup point, you have an opportunity to uh, define what different um, levels of engagement in the cooperative will be, whether that's, uh, you know, the people doing the work or the wider community, as uh, Corrine was talking about the, the members as well as the workers. So, um, so I guess if there's a question, it is how, have you worked with startups and then what kind of ways do they have of uh, engaging the people involved in the startup situation? Can I ask, is it a, is it a, is it a retail or what kind of a co-op are you from? It's a, a service oriented. So uh, doing um, uh, uh, community Reiki treatment part volunteer, part paid uh, at uh, various uh, locations. So right now we're in suspension due to the pandemic because you know no hands-on work is happening. So it's an yeah. opportunity to right. sit back and reevaluate and you know start again. Sure, yeah. Cool. Um, well, I think that I have not worked with a startup. So I'll start by saying that I have not worked with a startup. Um, I have had conversations with startup general managers in the retail area who think it's a great idea to start this right from the get go, um, just as part of building that internal culture, that organizational culture, just start off right away with this. Um, and even though you maybe don't have any results yet, you could still, I think, come up with things that you wanted to start tracking um, that would maybe then evolve as you got closer to opening. And then once you were up and running, you could begin to track some of those uh, key financial indicators um, that you're aiming for with your business. Um, so I, I would say if you're intrigued, uh, you know, by all means build it right from the start. And, and oh, the other thing I wanted to say is, is that the time commitment one of the things that's really nice is that once it's going, so it does take some work in terms of the steps towards implementation. There's some time involved there. There's some work involved there for sure. But once it's up and running, um, it's really that one hour a week. And then there's not a whole lot of additional time that is really required. There are oftentimes a few tasks that get um, volunteered for during the meeting. So it, it, it becomes people's choice if they want to give a little bit of extra outside of that meeting time. But really, one of the nice things about it is it's meant to not take a ton of labor to keep it going. And, you know, if people can engage at a, at a one hour a week or even, you know, meet twice a month 
and then it's only you know two hours a month or whatever you can keep the commitment i think pretty minimal and still um, get the point across and allow for people to engage so that's my best advice on that Hope thank helps. you very much You're welcome go ahead angela yeah. there um, I come from working with farms and other seasonal cooperatives. And so there's a couple specific challenges that um, arise. You know, one is that the off season, most of the labor is not there. And most of the, whether they're members or non-members of the co-op, um, there might be like a couple people on. Um, and then the other, you know, for a CSA farm in particular, most of the sales um, happen in the off season or are done by like May 1st or June 1st. You know, you don't have, it's not like a retail setting on some farms where you have this year round sales number. Um, and I was like, oh, is that going to create some type of slippery slope um, towards really focusing on something like labor because it's a huge factor on, you know, farms and land-based businesses, um, you know, or, you know, are there ways or do you have experience with working with folks um, that have figured out how to create a balance and a system that makes sense in these types of enterprises. Anyone that specific? So like a, a farm, but I have worked with businesses that are very seasonal in their, their sales flow, if you will. So knowing that they make a large percentage of their sales, like during the summer, they have very low levels of sales during the winter for in a, in a seasonal community. And it is a challenge um, to figure out how to get it up in order to track on that year here. Um, but I also think it can be super valuable in that setting and especially to help everything in the business to be able to understand that season at level and you have to, you know, as you know, running a business like that, you can. So, um, for those times in which you don't have the sales coming in and especially if you have labor going out. And so I think some and Melanie, up your board that Melanie, I'm going to interrupt you, yeah. and um, we're we're getting a lot of lag in your video and audio. Um, maybe we can try to turn your video off again. Sorry about that. It's not telling me I'm unstable, but apparently I am. <laughs> Let me stop my video. So what I was trying to say, uh, Angela, is that I think. If I were you, I would want to set up your board for an entire year so that you could really see that entire cycle um, in one view. So you'd have to have a really long board, but maybe you wouldn't have very many lines on your board. <laughs> so it could be a long, narrow board. <laughs> but I think that would be part of the key would be to really being able to see it a whole year so that people could really see like, yeah, we have all this money coming in here and then we have to balance out, you know, the spending on the labor over this much longer period of time that doesn't necessarily match with when the money's coming in. Does that, am I, does that sort of fit <laughs> not knowing your business it's a little tricky but that's what comes to mind for me is I would really want to see that entire year cycle really you know educate people about the challenges of that long cycle yeah I think that addresses pieces of it I mean do you have anything to add to the I mean the major like shift in labor it's just about keeping it going in the off season with the few people that are there and then just getting everybody re-engaged once, like, let's say the cruise starts again in the spring. Oh, I see what you're saying. So like nobody's there to participate during a long stretch of the year. And so they would be, get disconnected. Yeah. 
Well, geez, now we're all functioning in a Zoom world. You know, you could just <laughs> do your open book meetings via Zoom during the off season so that people who weren't there could participate. Um, that could be one solution. I mean, again, if it's just once a week, maybe people are able to engage at some level if they could show up, you know, once a month or a couple times a month or something like that. Um, uh, or people kind of come in and out of it, you know, and that could be all right too if you you if you build it into your culture, um, and you know they they are super seasonal and they're not around, they could just come in and out, and and it could just you know kind of shift seasonally with with flow in and out of people. Great, thanks. One of the things that even in a even in a setting where it's not seasonal. It's, it's different people. I mean, that's part of what you want, actually, is different people in the room um, every week so that you get some different perspectives, you know, and, and that everybody gets to participate because, like, if you're, um, well, any business that you're running, you need certain people who aren't in the meeting at any given point in time to be doing other things. And so everybody can't go every week. So that's, you know, kind of part of the charm is you have different people in the room every week, sharing different perspectives, different ideas, um, different questions, those kinds of things. So that can actually be a plus. Thanks. Any other questions? Do any of you um, currently practice open book management? Is this something that some of you are already doing at your organizations? I'd be curious to hear from anyone who's already doing it. I had a quick question. Um, I was curious. Yeah, sure. Or, go ahead. For you, you mentioned you've worked with retail organizations. Um, for like larger organizations that have implemented Open Book um, during the weekly huddle, when you have a bunch of staff coming in, do do people usually like change the department which they clock in and out of, um, or is that like, like labor time that they're spending there just going to uh, you know the labor cost center, or is it going to like an admin cost center? That's a really good question. And typically it just goes to their own department. Um, and it's, you know, really seen as kind of a value add, right? Like it's a good thing when people go and it's a, it's a, it's seen as a positive in terms of spending that labor. Um, as long as people are going and, and participating and, you know, uh, and which does tend to be the case. Um, people don't just, you know, go to the meeting to not participate, but that I suppose could be a potential pitfall. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it goes just to the department that they normally work in. Cool, thank you. Of course. Yeah, I, I've worked with Open Book at uh, Honest Rate Food Co-op before, and um, we actually are at the time the the board of directors uh, ended it. Uh, they said it was not a good use of uh, our payroll dollars. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it was during a time of great transition, so. Um, yeah, it was unfortunate because we we did like a very robust training with Zingerman's and it cost a pretty good yeah. amount of money. Um, and yeah. Then, yeah, so there was like a significant investment, uh, tried it out for maybe over a year and then uh, sort of pulled the plug, but there was mixed results. So I have a follow-up question. Yeah, I, yeah sure. Uh, 
what so what's the balance like is there a way to you know have this be a leaner process with maybe less indicators and um you know tailor it tailoring it that way uh to fit better into very uh you know very lean operations i guess So uh, are you asking about how many lines you should have on your board? Or am I understanding your question correctly? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so can you minimize it? And I'm okay. thinking also um, for, for rocks, that might be where, where they would be heading uh, in this process um, towards a, a more a smaller big board, a small big board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll call that the small board. <laughs> yes, I think that um, you can, you can have fewer lines and in order to customize your board for whatever your organization is. So for um, for a rock or for the farm example that Angela brought up, um, or even for the, the startup that was mentioned, you know, you can have as few lines on your board as you want to, as long as you don't have so few that it begins to lose its impact um, I have seen in the, in the food co-op sector, I've seen it where a couple of general managers had been rolling with it in sort of the traditional board that I showed you the example of with sales and labor and things like that. Um, and then decided that they needed their meetings to be a little bit shorter because, you know, labor was tight or whatever. And so they shrunk it down and only started hitting on, you know, five points per meeting. And it just sort of unraveled as a result of that. And it became less meaningful. There wasn't very much storytelling going on because they were trying to minimize the time. And it really just lost its impact and completely fizzled out over time. So I do think that that's a lesson in making sure that you keep it robust enough that it's relevant for your organization. And I do think that even, you know, one hour twice a month is probably about the minimal in order to maintain that level of sort of engagement and participation with it. Um, I, I understand that sometimes a weekly meeting feels like too much and depending on the type of businesses that you are, it might be too much. Um, but a couple times a month is probably the minimum. And um, I would say allow enough time so that you can have robust conversations because um, what I have found is that without the storytelling, then again, you, you really sort of quickly lose the impact of, of the meeting and, and, and people just aren't able to engage with the information in a way that feels meaningful to them. It's, then it just becomes looking at numbers, which is not what it's solely setting out to do. We do have about 10 minutes left, so there's room for a couple more questions. Uh, 
Um, I, so I have one question uh, regarding the great game of business book that you uh, mentioned in the beginning. Is that something that you would, if someone is, um, I guess you, you did kind of recommend reading that, but um, for anyone here, would that be a good starting point leaving this uh, workshop uh, as a next action? Yes, absolutely. I would highly recommend reading The Great Game of Business. I think it's the natural starting point for sure. Um, and, um, you know, doing that book club idea, you know, share that book with people in your organization. Um, I've, you know, I've known some managers who buy like half a dozen copies or whatever. And then, you know, groups of people read the book and have kind of a book club around it and, and some discussions about it. I think it's a great way to explore whether or not you have, you know, broad interest in the organization um, for the idea. Um, and it's a great read. Um, it's interesting and um, it tells, it, it's a, certainly an, an interesting story. So yeah, highly recommend the book. It's very good. And I would also say, um, I didn't catch his name, but somebody from, uh, somebody mentioned The Honest Weight and, you know, uh, Zingerman, Zingerman, I don't know, pre-pandemic was doing open book management training where they actually come in a couple days uh, on site with you and, you know, teach to the ropes. And uh, it's, you know, pretty powerful. Like they're really, really good at what they do. Uh, there are options out there um, for getting outside support only. Super love to support any of you, <laughs> but there are other people out there that do this work as well. And, you know, co-ops are so uh, into P6 and sharing information and ideas and helping each other along that you know, I reached out to any of the co-ops that are currently practicing or have practiced open book. I know some aren't doing it right now because of the pandemic and all of that, but um, I'm sure everybody's willing to share their stories and, and what they've learned and any models that they might have that would be helpful too. So I would say, you know, there's, there's definitely lots of resources out there. Thanks. Jeffrey has a, another question. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, just a quick comment. Uh, back in the 70s, I was looking at, uh, I picked up a book called Honest Business, and the co-authors were Michael Phillips and Sally Raspberry. And it was a whole book about how to do uh, um, a small business. And I think one of the chapters was advocated you should open your books, not only to your employees, but to the public. So anybody who comes in and wants to see how you're doing business, you should be transparent. You know, that it wasn't really in a cooperative, you know, he was just uh, doing it as a general advice. But since then, I think it's gone out of print and I haven't been able to find it. And I lost my original copy. So if anybody comes across it, it's a, it's a good one. Honest, Sounds interesting for sure. <laughs> honest business. Yeah. Yeah, I have come across a few people over the course of my years working with Open Book in various settings, friends who own own businesses and things like that who you know we'll be talking and they'll start describing you know how they run their business and how they engage with their employees and you know describing open book management to me and I'm like oh well, have you read Jack's so bad years ago and so there I think there's a lot of it in some form or another form or in necessarily follow any particular format you know that's kind of the cool thing about it you can make it your own and it, it, it it's just about sharing creating a culture around finance so 
So uh, I love that about it. It's very malleable. <clears throat> yeah, we had been practicing it for about three years and just given the, the team uh, understanding of finances and the amount of time it was taking to like run some calculations based on the information we sort of defaulted to going back to reading just like the PL and the balance sheet so you took away your big board is that what you're saying <clears throat> yeah it had always existed in a spreadsheet that was shared um so it's still there on google drive but um yeah we we sort of stopped updating it um and yeah just we use QuickBooks, so all the information was in QuickBooks and everybody had access to it. So um, we just sort of went to defaulting to that. Um, sure. Yeah, I think that's that scenario that I was describing where, you know, you, when you lose the storytelling and when you lose that sort of community gathering aspect of the meeting, I think then you lose some of the impact of the, the participation and engagement from people. I don't know if that was your experience, but that's what I've seen. Yeah, no, I think, I think that um, could definitely happen. We're like a smaller organization that does bookkeeping. So uh, the story is pretty straightforward, I guess. There's not like a bunch of other departments and things sure. like that. Well, uh, great questions and comments, everyone. I hope that this was super helpful for you and I look forward to seeing y'all out there along the way at some point. I do get to Maine on occasion, or at least I used to. <laughs> February, right? Thanks, Emmy. <laughs> yeah, thank you so Usually much. <laughs> thank you so much, Melanie. Yeah. I I learned a lot. I'm super excited to have have been here to watch your presentation. Um, yeah, it's it was great, and uh, I'm gonna just. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna end it here. I thank you all for all the good questions and uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Emmy. Thank you.